talk I'm going to do is slightly different in the sense that although I trained as an artist and graduated as an artist and ended up working, I don't know, three, four hundred schools and graduated from doing higher, higher education um, and finally ended up teaching at Central St. Martin's and um, I was also a researcher at the University of Westminster. It was in 2003 where I basically decided that being an artist and curating, which is what happened during the last few years of my life as an artist, was in a sense a clash of interests. Um, there was quite a lot written about it in terms of how one can proceed in the shows that one curates or how one can work with a group of people that one has worked with for a very long time. And in a sense, there was a point in 2003 where I was offered a job at a, a very interesting institution in, in Berlin called Hafti Kuchin de Bellet. Um, and I took that job knowing that I'm walking into a, a, a German institution, the first person of color as such to be ever in this position in the whole of Germany, most probably at that time also in Europe. Um, and it's not something which has changed greatly, um, but it's something one, one lives with and sees what one can do to make those changes which are necessary. It was a very hard job. It was from 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. Exhibitions um, which were from around the world, from everywhere from Brazil to Japan, and also performances, talks, conferences, a film program, and publications that went with these exhibitions. And then since then, I've returned back to Britain, uh, but I more or less now just curate in Europe and in Asia. For three years, I've worked predominantly in India um, with foundations thinking through that relationship around the notion of global arts. But tonight, I want to talk more about um, what all of that has, in a sense, produced, especially in terms of performance and artists who make performances. So the talk is quite theoretical in some ways, but it's also based on what I think is happening, what is going on, and the ways that one can look at history and situate it within the contemporary. So many artists who do, whose practice are predominantly performance-based, are often, I realize, recognized by a kind of autobiographical tone of their work. And in a sense, identity has became, or has, is, a kind of primary credential. Um, and when we start talking about these concepts, or talk about the consequences, the expectations, in terms of how certain performance artists are often framed, marked, or even dramatically characterized within the wider discourse, we have to be quite careful, but at the same time, look at it more in terms of how it has helped them. Even in writing this short synopsis for this talk, I had to have a little feedback from Philippa um, about how one, in a sense, communicates subtleties in even a very short amount of text. Because the messages which we do pass around in the art world and the way we communicate are often very complex in the way that they're formulated and formatted and how they're received. Some receive them and some don't. And the word art for itself has been something which has been so sort of like dogging me for a very long time. It's, it's a term which is used quite a lot, um, but it is a term which is actually coined by somebody who is very disillusioned at a particular moment now, and yet very influential, is the art critic Arthur Danto. And he was a very, he is a very interesting figure, remains so. But he has, in a sense, pulled himself out of the art world at this particular moment in relationship to, or his non-relationship to the way the art world is reformulated in the last two decades or three decades. Dante's definition is, can be glossed in the following way. He suggested something is a work of art if and only if, and he made four clauses for this. He suggested it has to have a subject about which, and 
second process, about which it projects some attitude or point of view. So maybe it also means has to have time. Yeah. The third clause was it has usually a metaphoric elliptic reasoning or reading. What he meant by that is that it can energizes the audience to in a sense participate in filling in what is missing in the artwork. It was the fourth clause, which was really interesting, as it was a question, in the sense that what he decided to say was that it required, a, required an art historical context. Now, in a sense, talking about art history, which we are all involved in, or making art history, which is what we should be involved in, which is our goal, it is, in a sense, we are entering an institution. It is not an open institution. We shouldn't be so beguiled by it. But what I think is interesting in terms of how the art world functions for artists who are interested in performance, and I'm, I use the term performance as a very expanded term here, because most artists, in a funny way, use performance partly in the way that they create themselves and embellish their work with their presence. I did get interested in this idea of how this autobiographical, which is attached, this tagging, it remains sort of indexically linked in the way the work is not only presented, but the way it is received and how it remains historicized. Of course, the first person one would go to for that as an example would be Joseph Boyce. Now, a very passionate German artist who, in 1941, volunteered for the Luftwaffe, which was the, the well, at that point, the Nazi um, Air Force. But ever since he recanted the story of how he was rescued from the air crash, where he survived and his fellow didn't, where he suggested he was wrapped in fact and felt to keep him alive. This image has remained deeply, deeply ingrained in the way we view his work. And he produced a great amount of work. He wasn't one who just produced for a certain amount of time and then disappeared. He produced over a very long period of time. He has said in his own memories, remembrance, that covered my body in fact to help it regenerate warmth and wrapped it in felt as an insulator to keep warmth in. That idea is how, in many ways, we read his performances and especially his sculptures, which uses felt and felt. It is an inconsistent story. Boyce's work, his own biography, and his subjects are very open to any sort of reinterpretation. Many people have written about this particular story and how it served, in a sense, the making of a powerful myth, a myth of the origin of a particular artist, which is one way a number of artists do proceed and provide the first tag into the art world. It provides a kind of interpretative key for others who might be not interested in the use of, let's say, unconventional methods or materials which Boyce was interested in using. Boyce was also known for his very cranious, his, his very impolite public acts. Now again, this created possibly a dispassionate reading of his work, but that myth allowed him to create these sort of works, to impede on other people's public spaces and institutions. So in a sense, when one, one encounters an artist like Boyce, that encounter is resolved by the dilemma of that kind of autonomous representation of a history that was present in the way that we look at his work. We, we bring back history to say, yes, but he went through this. He was great. He survived. Felt in fact. And that's it. That felt in fact allowed him to have a very interesting career for, for 40, 50 years. 
Boyce went on to find and uh, formed, basically, or founded the German Student Party, the Free International University for Creativity and Interdisciplinary Research, as well as in 1976, he ran for the German Bundestag, the equivalent of our parliament. He created, from that myth, it grew and grew into a point where he was actually a national hero, even, to, even if he had been involved in the Nazi efforts. It, in a sense, that myth overrode every other thing else that was part of his autobiography. So what I'm suggesting here is that in mapping a legacy, especially if you're interested in what are known as avant-garde materials, for instance, materials which are not necessarily incorporable or incorporated into what we know as to be collected or to be seen with, possibly there are ways how they've been used in art and that kind of self-governance, the autobiographical, to a certain extent, becomes sort of a necessary portal to confront the conservative ideological art world. And it is a conservative ideological art world. We should not forget that. In many ways, that avant-garde trajectory is often a necessary strategy as an act of the renewal of democracy. If there is anything to be said of art as a democratic form, it has to be renewed. It cannot be taken for granted. The second, in a sense, idea that came about by looking at how artists have been able to be self-sufficient, be able to articulate their presence in the market or within their generation, to some extent, especially after decades which, which, which follow boys, where there was a large formations of groups rather than associations, collectives and cooperatives rather than international coalitions around ideas, would be to look at, historically, to look at the Black Mountain College. Again, it's a really interesting bunch of people who we read about on every day. A narrative of the Black Mountain College would be how they related to each other, that casuality. A narrative that emerged in many ways from how, as artists, they became known as interdisciplinary artists. Um, it provided a kind of collective marking. It included dancer and choreographer Merz Cunningham, and composer and musician John Cage, alongside Robert Rauschenberg, Buckminster Fuller, uh, the first, uh, uh, John Cage's, and the alumni is fantastic, John Cage's student was Alan Capro, who later turned that held the first happening. It's a history, in a sense, through a coalition of ideas and of disciplines. One cannot understate the effect of the Black Mountain College on the American, as well as the world, seen as an experimental nature of practice committed, and again, this is a really interesting thing, committed to a multifaceted approach, which I think both the, the artists who were going to talk about it is a necessity. And I'll argue about that a bit further behind. Yeah. All right. In a sense, to be extensive, to be influential in your one, one's own career, which is what every artist wants to do, there has to be, to some extent, an allowance for the multifaceted uh, to maybe attract others towards you. Not only others like you, but others who have maybe similar commitment and come from a different field. What the Black, Ma Black Mountain College allowed was composers, visual artists, poets, designers to come together and allow the complexity and the notion of complexity is very interesting and important for artists, but remains not so for the art world. And to some extent, again, I would suggest this commitment to a democratic governance, to the idea of arts, rather than kind of genius governance, which is what the art world is likely to be in. The central to the Black Mountain College was, of course, 
experience of learning. Not learning by yourself, but learning together. And from that, to a certain extent, arriving to, not through a sort of logical certainty, but in a, in a holding together of some ideas and occupying a space in a sense. How the artwork evolves, how the market or institutional practices um, function is not clearly provable. Nobody in this room can tell you it goes from A to B to C. It's not a logical world that you're functioning in. So don't expect logical answers to this place. Having said that, as somebody who is now and has been since 2004, more or less full time, involved as a curator and as a writer, I have many conversations with artists. And in that, I tried to mine it to try and work out what is it that can be evaluated about what lies as their potential, what have they sourced, in a sense. Where is that fountainhead? Of course, always, this historical legacy, including this autobiographical tagging and the formation of groups, turns out they provide cohesive steps, historical steps, towards recognition and accommodating one's practice into funding and exhibition structures. Of course, the other thing is, one has to realize, is that when you are in a place where you are working in a group, and I don't mean on an everyday basis necessarily, you can have your studio practice, but in a, in a collective manner, collective networking to some extent, is a gives you a greater amount to distribute your ideas and to address the goals for visibility and continuity, which is what you want to do. We find ourselves, especially in cities like London, Berlin, Mumbai, Kingston, you name it, living and working increasingly with expensive cities. Rental arrangements are gradually absolutely unmanageable. It wasn't the case even 15, 20 years ago. Art and luxury are kind of cohabitating. There's a reversal, in a sense, of the art, uh, the control of the arts within its stakeholders. So what I mean by that, Art practitioners, its producers, are in absolute competition with the art industry. The art industry has a disproportional power, its prowess, in a sense, has disturbed the trust that used to be between artists and the art world. There used to be a trust based on goodwill, generosity, and other traditional factors which were part of the art world, philanthropy, patronage, even access to media, state controls, private, uh, sorry, state collections, private collections, artists used to actually bring them to the gallery to say, this is what I'm doing and this is how you can buy it. Now, and in many cases, galleries and their assistants <coughs> mediate these relationships. It has kind of broken that interpersonal space which artists have created where they exchange ideas. And now those ideas have been replaced more or less by an economy of science. We do always, in every aspect of our lives, whether in real lives or in as artistic lives, look for security in our relationships. It's a given, but increasingly so, the models which are here, that we function within, are not matching up to the reality very well. From a curatorial perspective, what I think is sort of interesting is to think about, and I'm going to sort of like talk about three models. Do I have the time? Yeah? Are you all right with this? Yes. All right. How some 
artists are presenting their ideas and operating in this, in this contemporary se setting. Possibly, it has allowed certain artists to recover the pace of the development of their works. But more importantly, which I think is really, really important for artists, is a sense, a preservation of a sense of independence, both as producers, and what I think is an important element for artists to think through, is their active involvement in curatorship. The, the following trends which I'm going to talk about are fragile relationships, especially artists who are involved in marginalized practices I mentioned prior to performance, but also those who are involved in digital works, for instance, or artists who are involved as uh, Linda suggested, ephemeral works. Or as some artists have found themselves recently in places in the Middle East, like Egypt and in Libya, they produced art as a protest because there's nothing else they can do. There are no galleries, there are no spaces. So art is a part of the protest. And in a sense, we have to accept the changes also um, of the working reality that we find ourselves with or outside of, especially outside of institutional curators and collectors' raisins. We're always going to remain outside of that, and there are ways also to get in. I would suggest the first of the two changes is in the rise of how many artists are using lectures and essays as a particular way to talk about their practice. Something that stems possibly from the 90s, 1990s, where the production of ethical frontiers was based in the way that one read theory and how theory then expressed itself in practice. Recently in performance, there have been a number of artists who see themselves performing a context, a perform performing context. Something I would hasten to add, add here that is not necessarily consider considered as performance by many organizations who are involved in performance art. One of the main uh, persons, I mean, the, uh, the prime practitioners, let's say, of essay performers include Peter Stel, Harun Faruqi, Liam Gillick, and Rabbi Mrook. All present cautionary tales approximating a social consciousness from a, from a global perspective. In a sense, a perspective that dovetails to a culture of anxiety. The relevant factor about this group of artists is that we have to consider not only how they're performed in terms of the market and gather institutional support that initiates curated exhibitions, but these artists' practices is associated to the pioneering efflux email subscription. Um, it's a service. We all have it. It has an increasing meta database and it's, it's seen by many as progressively experimental in its ideas. This thrust comes from EFA's editorial board, who see themselves as professionalizing the promotional agencies for global institutions, and I don't mean national global institutions. What EFA, in a sense, has provided or effectively provided is a series of opportunities and settings for a group of artists which are then linked to the data and potentials that these critical writers, speakers, performers, video-based artists have taken up and have created, in a sense, a bringing philosophical rim. Originally, a number of these artists were presented through Egypt Eflux's journals and conferences. They even had a building in uh, Berlin, which was uh, a forum. Initially, through Eflux and its initiatives, 
these artists end up not only curating, but being curated into international uh, institutional exhibitions, then into compatible collections, and then have successfully ventured into the commercial market. The idea of the campus, the model of the campus, of assembled intellectuals within a directed agenda is one which we always had felt in the past would be the domain of endowed institutions, such as the Sainsbury Center or the Getty Foundation. But recently, if you look more closely, it has been devoted often to art publications. Fries is proposing to build an art school, for instance, is one of those initiatives. I would call this the kind of first wave of associative practices, where perspectives and art services, inclusive of market and curating, have been very effective in linking data to an emerging discourse. To an extent that I would suggest that it is shaping discourse and shaping the network. There are a number of museums involved in this, the number of art colleges, especially in America, involved with this group, and a great deal is going on in Europe around this agenda. These artists are regularly programmed, regularly teaching, um, and in a sense, the discourse itself from this group and from Plus has found itself emerging very successfully in the market. A second and lesser emerging platform, which is also relative and related to this discourse, has its emphasis on geographies, rather than a political address. I would call it an expanding narrative to some extent. The content is articulated and reflective. It uses both fictional and non-fictional places. It again uses the performative lecture as its main base with installations and collectibles, including publications. This sort of work is embracing the work of Simon Fujiwara and Slaves and Tartars. These I I artists rely a hell lot on commissions, especially by sympathetic foundations and biennales rather than collectors but they ended up also concurrently working with galleries. Their work, which is collected, is often in forms of objects, videos, but it's the process which is interesting, because the process allows them to realize often multiple, including self curatorial platforms, from which relics as publications, objects, video, documentary materials, are released as commercial stock. In a former time, presenting research and strategy for artistic practice had remained the sole domain of research funding from higher education institutions. Um, as research as practice is often precarious, it's a balancing act, it's a strategic reformulation. But people like Slams and Counters very regional linguistic web-like encasing of Simon Fujiwara's intriguing journeys involving gumshoe detective work, archaeologists, travel and sexuality, reveal very specific correlations. They have one of our funders willing to stay, the course, a condition that allows a great deal of curatorial independence as well as projects which last sometimes three to four years and the funding that's required to last three to four years. What makes it interesting is that there's a fascinating absorption between the artist's process, which empowers, to some extent, the funders who end up contributing as co-producers. It's that longevity, the discourse that drives it. This came to the fore in the, in, I would suggest, in the undertaking of, um, oh, where is it? Yeah, there it is. This came to the fore in the undertaking of the ambitious Kremasa cycle, 
by the performance work of Matthew Barney, which then ended up as film works, but also major artist film works. The Kremer Society was produced by the New York Gallery's Barbara Gladstone, produced, not only shown, but produced. It had a great curatorial mission and an achievement in tackling a difficult, and especially in America, the film industry is heavily industrialized and protected. So a new genre, in a sense, appeared. What also is it fast becoming obvious that artists who do preside over an authority, especially over unrestrained assembly, are definitely operating in this mode. Ryan Trekarton's co curation of the New Museum Triennale, which is on at the moment, called Surround, uh, surround, type, surround Audience, provides a generational setting. What the papers have called, an article uh, in, in, uh, in the days called, grapples with the sense of multiple realities, or at least the idea that the digital has diced and sliced the way in which we experience the world. The presence of Craig Cartman's work at the Venice Biennale, at major commissions with the Kunstwerk in Berlin, the Zubinovich collection here in London, has allowed him to insert his sense of community of interlocutors, including now the New York-based Disc Collective, which is going, to, which who are going to be the forthcoming curators of the Berlin Biennale, with a budget of around six million euros. I would suggest, and I'm going to try and end here, is that the real presence and the recent presence of artist collectives, collectives has enforced a sense of production, self-determination, a battle against hegemonic invisibility, and a sense of powerlessness which many, many artists feel and are scared of, it, in a sense. I tried to make a list of the collectives who have successfully ventured both within the curatorial realm and increasingly are persuasive in the arts. Some have what made, in a sense, as I suggest, a kind of synchronic synchronicity to a generation or to a medium or even to a market or their place in the market. But the role of the collective is not solely based on networking, but by observation, which guides the intuitive nature of how they have, so they have understood and read artists' careers in their national state, and later on, their standing in the international world. And these collectives are different parts of the world. For instance, in India, you have the Rocks Media Collective, Collective Camp. You have China, Made in Company, uh, Indonesia, Rangrupa, Brazil, Chalka Ferreira, Slavton Tartars in Germany, Delity in Austria, Autolith Group, as well as the Archive of Modern Conflict in the UK, Dantai in Japan, Chocolate in Russia. A whole lot of people functioning within the collective. Often the collective is very much disciplinary, thoughtful, provocative, especially about the absolute history of authorship and questions representation. They are a lot of time involved in the notion of the positivity turn that shapes histories towards an allowance of complexity. We know and understand that artist careers, regardless of what you formulate yourself around and how you see the world, progresses in leaps and bounds. Whether it's sales, media attention, scale of work, or critical acclaim, any factor. Artists, to a certain extent, are apprehensive about other artists, but also Artists are also under scrutiny all the time from the roving eyes of curators and institutions. 
In a sense, the artist remains a subject of research. How they are programmed, how they are placed, proximity to specific goals, commercial or other. But what we have to be aware is how one approaches the idea of success. Success here, I would underline, can net not be only result in idea of the sales of work or adulation. There are many a circuit breaker out there that can study the course of development. The recent case of the performance artist Terence Cole whose meteoric rise but short career is a key example. Major, major exhibitions on both sides of the Atlantic, commercial galleries, as you can see from here, as well as involvement with pop celebrities, did not protect his practice. Cole is not the first or the last to be emotionally and physically surrendered to the pressure of performing as a lifestyle, artist as a lifestyle. That storyline and possibly the commercial swag can become very toxic. What it requires is balanced, persistent measure, an approach where you are compelled towards others, where each conversation, and there should be many conversations that one should have, does not need to be a test, but the coming together of ideas and experiences. So important in the art world. There's no set career path in the arts. No two artists are alike, are like snowflakes. Some of you might see it as incoherent, which it is. It unfolds in its own timeline, as it does. It is independent as well as dependent on its pacing. It does need a lot of maintaining. But one should not stop critically thinking and speculating about the art world's myth, your role in it, and your own self-mythology. And I would suggest one should test oneself ever so often by experimentally curating yourself to make the sense of the whole. In other words, just don't think about aesthetic or the art historical or the career, but test your own place within it. Thank you.